Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first panel for today. Education plays a critical role in acting as um, a testbed for innovation and teaching that to future generations. But sometimes when it comes to digital fashion and art, it feels like education is a little bit behind the curve. My name is Ashwini Deshpande, and I'm a digital fashion designer at Meta, previously known as Facebook, and I'm also a graduate of London College of Fashion. Today, I'm going to be speaking to these panelists here about the tools and resources needed to drive adoption of digital fashion and art in education. Let's start off with some introductions. Uh, Mimi, if you want to kick us off, please. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mimi. I am uh, teaching at Central St. Martins, University of Arts London, and at uh, Design and Engineering Department of Imperial College London under the Faculty of Engineering. And I'm involved mostly in the innovation management course, uh, the master's one, uh, which is now expanding into teaching blockchain at uh, UAL, which is quite exciting. And mainly in Imperial, we're doing something uh, called MANA Lab, which is the future of work in blockchain research group. So more focusing on scientific research and PhD students, bringing them together and trying to produce papers towards, um, towards like research into blockchain. Uh, and Central Samarit is more hands-on projects. Amazing, thank you. Christina, do you want to? Hi, my name is Christina. Um, I'm an immersive experience designer, um, co-founder of ArtsXR, an immersive production studio, and I'm also a, an associate lecturer at UAL CCW in immersive technologies. Chris? Thank you, Ash. Uh, is my mic working? Yes. Hi there. So my name is Chris Follows. I'm the academic lead for research and development into immersion technologies across Camberwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon Colleges of Art, which is part of University Arts London, um, which basically means I'm working with academic staff to basically scope out what emerging technologies could be pot potentially useful for their courses or, or new courses um, that may come out of uh, emerging technologies. Um, I'm also a co-founder of ArtsXR, a immersive um, production company. And I'm an artist, so I studied uh, fine art painting back in, graduated in 2000. And since then I've been exploring, well, since then I've, I've always explored digital in my practice. Um, I'm kind of fully making digital paintings at the moment um, and exploring NFTs. Thank you. Amazing, thank you. Um, so my first question is quite simple. It's where do you think education is at currently and what is sometimes holding it back from keeping up with the pace of the industry? Okay, I can start. <laughs> uh, I think historically you have blockchain papers, like scientific research from the 60s even. So basically it comes from the cryptography and mathematics, but it kind of gets stuck there until you get some adoption. And of course adoption came later. Usually innovations comes into adoption when there's a need. So of course the need came after the financial crisis. We had to come up with better financial systems. Um, and the funny thing about research is that like you have in R&D all of these concepts, all the theories, but they will never be implemented until a big organization will come in uh, and introduce it to the users. Um, and right now, where we are aware of blockchain, NFTs, and digital fashion, the thing that stops universities, from my point of view, is the whole stigma in media. So that's when the students are quite uh, reluctant to enter the space because for them it's a Ponzi scheme, it's scams. There was an article in Artnet yesterday or two days ago that came out and it's like talking about NFTs that it's a big burst. Um, so that kind of portrays the story that discourages students to mint NFTs and, and, and enter that. And another one, I think, a big issue that blockchain, NFT, crypto is very related to investment and financial kind of speculations. And I think that's, again, something that blocks universities to introduce the topic into the students because we had a lot of panels last year at uh, CSM. And I could see on YouTube the chats, people were commenting like, how the university is feeling about giving students financial advice. And it's always the moment when we ask them to open the wallet, mint a free NFT, a POAP, for example, we would get a backlash that we are asking people to deposit money or like do any financial uh, activities. And I think yesterday I spoke to William Mapan and he said he's also teaching um, generative art coding, uh, creative coding in, in a, a universe in Paris. And he said, I can never use the word blockchain. I can do, let's do generative art, let's do creative coding, but don't mention NFT because otherwise he could lose his job. 
That's really interesting, the reputation it's got that way and how that's affecting its, its usage in education. What, what do you guys think about, I mean, NFTs or digital fashion and art in general? Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything uh, Mimi said. I think um, also it's potentially not black and white. I think, um, I think industry, there's parts of industry that are the same as parts of education. And there's parts of education that are, are really advancing and doing amazing stuff, and there's parts of education that that need you know need to um, uh, develop more and and get the expertise into to scale what they you know scale emerging tech into the into their curriculum. But you know, so, so I think it's the same across the board, um, especially around you know. I mean, I'm mostly in the art world, so you know, there's, if if you look at art galleries, you know, how many art galleries are actually you know, really getting into immersive tech uh, or into NFTs, into crypto or anything like that. You know, there's not a lot. Um, and that's the same with education. I think, you know, it's, it's essentially uh, a problem that needs to be, um, you know, needs a lot of attention to resolve. You know, it's, it's basically, you know, it's, it's a problem solving. Um, you know, you need to go in there and you need to basically evaluate each case um, specifically, and that's that's really what I'm doing within uh, university, which you can kind of see as a, as a sort of microcosm of that. In terms of okay, you've got courses that are really advancing, um, like creative computing courses, which will have no problem with emerging tech. But what what about ceramic courses? What about um, textile courses um, or costume design for theatre? You know, wh wh where do those courses go in this new world? So. Yeah. It's also about, it's a very fast moving technology and implementing anything into a curriculum takes a long time. So by the time it's implemented in the curriculum, it's completely obsolete. So um, I think unless people are willing to experiment and it's a bit like industry, where unless you have players that are willing to experiment and take a leap of faith and say, okay, I'm gonna go with this, might be a failure, I'll just give it a go and see and then hopefully it will pay off. Um, it's the same in education. It's not like um, you're you know, um, playing with the students, but it's uh, trying to experiment and pushing the boundaries and that's when you get somewhere. And I think that's what we're doing at UL, where we have little research pockets and then just push that and yeah. Amazing. Um, so you kind of touched on my next question, but I'd like to delve a little bit deeper about um, so how, how can we enable universities to keep up with industry and to kind of be a step ahead, in fact, of the industry? Well, it is kind of implementing sh smaller groups of experimental design or in fashion, in art, and maybe also cross-disciplinary. I think that's when it gets really interesting and just testing out new technologies and also pushing the technologies um, to where it can go and yeah, maybe delving into Web3 and NFTs, but you know, just trying, trying it out basically. Let's see where it takes them. So, so yeah, I've got one example. So, um, so one of my colleges is uh, Wimbledon College of Art, which is a, one of the biggest performance centers now in Europe. And we are next, pretty much next door to Dimension Studios, which is a volumetric video capture studio. Um, and I kind of linked the two together with our, um, our students that are developing sort of theater design stuff. And um, Dimension Studios really invested some time in, in working with the students who were doing quite, quite traditional theater design, where they were hand making theater models and all this sort of stuff. And we applied a challenge to them with Dimension Studios about you know how, how would their ideas sort of translate into an immersive experience. Anyway, we went through like quite a few months of this exchange between the two, and then at the end, um, the students presented their ideas and their concepts. And what was really powerful was the um, the head of Dimension when he left basically said. <coughs> I didn't really understand why I was doing this until that moment, until the students presented their ideas, because he got a whole new perspective on his technology that he doesn't get in his industry at the moment. And I think that was super powerful for me. I think it's the exchange between industry and education as well, a bit like Gravity Sketch, what we're having right now. We're yeah. using it in a completely different way to what they're used to. I agree with the industrial thing. I think 
The moment it will be adopted at the university is the relevance, and there are three points about the relevance. One is, um, so last year LVMH came to CSM and they wanted to explore web free projects, so uh, I think two departments worked on NFTs. I think they came up with something with bees, like kind of Guerlain and LVMH project with Tezos. And that's kind of when they needed basically free labor, cheap labor of students who create NFTs and then go shoot uh, on the IP. Uh, but for the school, it's a relevant project because that's the project when university links to industry. The second moment when the school woke up was when Burberry reached out to CSM and said, we want to do something in Web3, we don't really know what to do, so can you guys do the course and we'll pay a lot of money. So they would ship the whole department from Burberry and then we'll teach about that. So again, it's two cases when it's basically money, client projects and client customized courses. And the first one, also halfly related about money uh, or relevance, it's where the students are graduated after university. So if we cannot provide them at least the foundation to find a job later, then that's a bad university. Because you always count on the index, like where do they get you know, like for example, you end up in, in Meta, right? So they would take your salary, average salaries of students graduating university, and that's kind of define how good is the university. So if we see the organizations like Balenciaga, LVMH, they all, um, Gucci, Dolce Gabbana, they all will have metaverse departments right now. And that was my main point when I was claiming this course for CSM, it's like, if you want your students to have a job after that, you need to teach them this because otherwise they will lose out on the market. And the moment they graduate CSM, they won't find a job. And that was the moment when the university was like, okay, let's do this because then we can say that our students end up in the metaverse department of Balenciaga. And that's one of the best PR things that can bring future students to the university. Uh -huh. um, that leads perfectly on to my next question, which is, um, you know, I'm a digital fashion designer, and I see that there's a talent deficit. There aren't enough fashion students, um, and fashion as an example, but art students in general, who are coming out with the most employable digital skills of tomorrow. Um, and a huge part of that for me, as somebody who is self-taught, a huge part of getting into that industry and having the career that I have today um, was the influence of the Digital Maker Collective. Um, and, you know, two of the core members are sitting here right now. So I love for you guys to tell us a bit more about the DMC, what it is, and what your aim is with the DMC, and how it's helped students over the years. So um, the Digital Maker Collective is a collective of uh, students, alumni, and staff of UIL across all the colleges. And uh, we have a shared interest in exploring technologies, any technology really, from com physical computing to uh, immersive to yeah, anything like adaptive paint, you know, generative coding, whatever. Um, it depends which um, members come and what their interest is and they push it along and then everybody comes along. So um, we, in lockdown, we obviously couldn't meet. So we just met weekly in uh, Frame VR, so a WebXR platform and developed. So we've actually only met yesterday in real life for the first we've, time. Yeah, we've known each other for years and I didn't actually believe they're, they're humans. I thought they were just <laughs> avatars, you know, and I saw them yesterday and I was like, Oh, you actually exist in flesh and blood, so <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> so we developed these projects and then we did, uh, like, um, for five years, we did uh, week-long residencies at Tate um, Modern, at Tate Exchange, where we took over a floor and just experimented again. And out of that came quite a lot of projects for the university. Um, and, and the reason I brought this up is because I think it's just a really good example of kind of um, something outside of the, the core education syllabus that's still educating students um, for, you know, the industry of tomorrow. So, um, yeah, apart from that, I, you know, about more about the DMC, I also want to know what your thoughts are about kind of individual learning and this sort of community-based learning versus more traditional education curriculum. Um, so I had one student, when we talk about individual learning, that she kind of followed our different uh, talks about blockchain and then, because she's a fashion designer, she trained herself and then she did a collaboration for a degree show with DressX. And she was like one of the few cases when she designed her thing and you could come and then try the outfit. And nothing was taught actually. So she did it by herself. She reached out to DressX and she did the whole collab herself. And, and that was kind of like the example when we as a university are supposed to just maybe bring a lot of different concepts. And then you can, as a student, especially for master um, degrees, find the one 
or the roots that you, you're interested in, and then you dig into that. And the same with coding. I mean, the best coders are not people from computer science. They are coders that are self-taught. So it's great to introduce them to Python, JavaScript, all of the different languages. And then if they like the flavor of the language, they can dig into that and then become generative artists. They can dig into that and become data scientists because they like Python, for example. If someone like, you know, JS, then they can go and do creative coding. So I think as a university, we should just show them as many possibilities as possible. And then if someone is ambitious enough, they will push forward and learn, join communities like that, um, like DMCs or like meetups, meet people, go to events like this and, uh, and evolve personally. I think that's, that's the best way. Yeah, and I think it's also about kind of critical mass. And I think, that, so the DM, Digital Maker Collective came out of walking across the university and seeing different people or individuals kind of on their own, isolated in this sort of uh, love of wanting to do digital, but there's no, there's no support system in place there. No one believes in it, but they believe in it. So the Digital Maker Collective was about bringing those, those kind of lost souls together to basically collectively explore that technology and, and have a home to do that. So, so I think that's you know, super important in terms of, you know, it kind of goes back to strategic and, you know, from the very top having a strategic plan of what you were talking about. You know, if the university can see, and I think this is the big barrier, is that, you know, people, a lot of people can't see the relevance or a real use case of that technology, so it's not relevant and it's not relevant for them. And, and that can impact on a curriculum and impact on a lot of uh, individuals. So I think having these little micro communities that, that are sort of uh, early adopters and um, innovators, Akashwini and everyone here, you know, it's super important. And we need to really sort of nurture those little communities because that's the way that we can keep developing really. Amazing. Thank you all so much for your incredible insights and knowledge on this. Um, that was super interesting. I'm sure the audience will agree. Um, and thanks to all of you for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you.